Lord, I pray that you would be with us tonight, that you would give us ears to hear, minds to really think and contemplate, process, that you would give us an attitude of partnership, an attitude that really kind of sits at your feet, asking you what we should do. Thanks uh, for Levi, for the way that you've wired him. Thank you for um, his passion and um, his willingness to step into a conversation, even though it was an assignment, which is kind of fun. Um, Lord, I do pray that you'd give him wisdom tonight, that as he's prepared and as he's ready uh, for what might happen in the next hour, that you would filter his mouth, that you would filter his thoughts, that you would filter his prep preparedness, that... Um, that as we kind of walk into this, that we would be collective. Give us a spirit of not only truth, but also of unity. Lord, I pray that we would be filled with grace in all things. In Christ's name. Amen. Um, Levi did not approach me with this subject. I approached Levi. And the reason I approached Levi was because of a an early meeting that we had. I think it was your first day on the job. Yep, yep. Um, so on the first Monday of the month, there are a bunch of area pastors who get together. People from Ankeny, Indianola, west side of Des Moines. Oh, that wasn't the first day. But yeah, sorry. Okay, <laughs> you're right. You're right. It, yes. I was thinking of the time you got me talking about it and I ran a red light. Yes. That was the first day. That was the first day. Yeah, I know. That was funny. But in, our, in your first day, we were talking about mm -hmm. some of those things. Um, but the very first actual pastor's meeting that you were part of, um, I, he, it was him and Tim's very first day, and uh, you know, with all these other pastors. I had them go through their introductions, who they were, where they came from, what they were pursuing, etc. And then I said, all right, after, after that kind of fluff stuff, I said, um, I've got a question for both of you to answer. What do you think the largest issue um, that the church will face in 10 years will be. It's an interesting thought when you, when you stop and analyze that, right? And I had not cued them for that. I had not prepared them for that question. And uh, it was funny, if I remember it correctly, Tim goes, well, I'm actually the interim, so I'm going to let the intern go first. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> and so then right out of the gate, swing and Levi says, I'm not sure what the issue will be in 10 years. And it was something along the lines, uh, as I remember it. Um, I'm not sure what the, the issue will be in 10 years, but I'm convinced that whatever that issue is, it's because we're not talking about it today. There's a little wisdom in that kid. That's what I thought right away. You, you, you said it's kind of fun getting to know us and having some of those preconceived <coughs> notions dissipate through the summer. It, the same is true on our end, too. And I remember thinking, oh, that, that's intriguing. And so I actually leaned in a little more. I said, all right, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And there was this moment in that meeting where he looked at me with a little smirk, like, okay, old man, if you want to go, here we go. And so it was kind of like, a metaphorical roll up your sleeve. And he just started kind of opening things up that are difficult to talk about, that actually we do talk about a lot, whether or not you know that. Um, and one of those subjects were, um, you know, how do we minister to the marginal, right? How do we minister to those who are on the fringe of society? And why is the church so quiet when it comes to this real critical issue and it's, there's a little bit of frustration, it seems, that we don't do a really good job at opening some of these dialogues up. I, I can't turn up the volume. I don't have a microphone. I just say everybody could turn off oh, the that, phone. That's a good that point, though. We could do that. Mute but, or turn off the phone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and, and to his point, I thought that that was a very fair assessment. Because the church really hasn't done that well. And so as we started to kind of offline those conversations, you know, specifically about the LGBTQIA2S plus people, um, the question is why don't we and how, how, what should we say? So um, I asked Levi, 
I said, well, one of the things I've kind of been thinking about, especially when we hired him, was I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to find something he could sink his teeth into. I wanted to give him kind of a final project, right? And that's what they do in college. So. And I said, hey, in the next couple of weeks, just start praying. Pray over, you know, what that final project could be. I want to see what the Spirit's telling you. And in those two weeks, <laughs> this is so funny. I, I, I was kind of thinking, it would be really neat to have Levi kind of facilitate some of this conversation with us. Because I think he's right. The church doesn't do a good job. Let's start doing a good job at that. That's kind of where the attitude was. But I remember giving him an opportunity to just kind of lean in and say, all right, Holy Spirit, what would you like me to do? And you came back after the two weeks. Do you remember your answer to me? I don't have anything. Yeah, no, he's not saying anything to me. He's like, ah, that's too bad because he told me something pretty good. <laughs> See, he had a chance to not do this. You, oh. you even warned me too. You were like, I've got something, but I don't think you're going to like it. <laughs> and so, so as we were just being really honest about, you know, kind of where the Spirit was leading us in that, I said, I'd like you to facilitate, uh, just start the conversation. Help Rising Sun have this dialogue. And... Uh, Oh boy. And so that, that is why we're doing that. I think that context is really important. Because, you know, as we've approached this, I've had people ask, what's going on? Like, why is Levi leading that? Because he's, like, I know why. It's because he's passionate about this, that the church does this right. But I think, really, genuinely, it could be, well, is Steve just, you know, deflecting? No, I'm not deflecting. You're going to see, you're going to hear a, a man who has... An incredible heart for Christ, incredible heart for truth, incredible heart for people. And it's pretty fun to be able to see that tonight. So, with no further ado, why don't you take it away, buddy? Yeah, uh, like Steve... Oh, and speak up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Steve said at the beginning, we want this to be pretty organic. Um, so I, I want it to be more of a dialogue, you know, than a monologue. I'm not really interested in talking for 40 minutes at you. Um, so during, uh, in, in light of that, um, there's going to be a Q&A section. At the end, we're dedicating kind of a lot of time to that. And I think for me, it's really become a lot more personal uh, in the last year. Uh, like I said, I'm going to school, and I just finished my first year. And while I've been at school, I've been making a lot of friends. And most of my friends at school are either um, they're, they're supportive of LGBTQ+, um, they're silent about it, they don't talk about it if they're not supportive, or they're part of the community. Um, and most of them are either part of the community or supportive. They're, there's not very many people who don't talk about it. Um, so having most of my close friends be people who believe things that are different from me, because I still believe, you know, um, that that it's ultimately it's wrong, uh, that homosexual acts are wrong. But how do I how do I talk to you know my friends about this? I didn't feel like I could. I didn't feel like I had any idea what I was supposed to say or that I knew this issue at all well from my standpoint. And I, I wondered kind of why the church seems like it's largely silent when it comes to this issue. And, and silence, in this case, being, you know, pretty detrimental, I think, because silence, silence can feel hostile and unwelcoming. Um, and I think that's, this is, this is a really important topic that, like, the church needs to be proactive about this. Um, so it, it came down to that question of, like, why, why is the church largely silent about this? And also... How do I love, like ultimately the question for me was how do I love these people that I care about in a way that they can recognize this love, but I'm still holding to my beliefs. So I'm not abandoning, you know, the truth just to avoid you know, conflict, but how do I love these people in, in a biblical way, how Jesus loved them, but also in a way that, that they see that I love them, that I'm not just, you know, stamping them into the ground or something. Um, and coming into this conversation, too, I think it's important to note um, that, one, I'm not an expert in this. I've been learning about it, but I, like, I'm not the final say. Absolutely not. Um, you know, take, take what I say with a grain of salt, as, as I think you should take all things. And, and the second, and along with that, 
uh, I'm not trying to foist, you know, radical I ideations or anything on you. Um, so please don't hear me saying that. You're going to get some of my bias through what I'm saying, because everybody is biased and it comes out. Um, but I I'm not trying to, you know, really just force anything on you guys. Um, the second thing is that this is not, by any means, um, an exhaustive, an exhaustive um, dive into this topic. Um, we're kind of just, it's, this is kind of just dipping the toe in the water, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of things, there's, there's a lot more to this. Um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, that I've been learning that would be cool to talk about, but it takes, it'll take, it would take like, you know, four hours to get to the point where we could talk about that. Um, and also just know that, you know, the, the, tonight is to start this conversation. Um, I'm not here to give a solution, uh, but provide resources and hopefully some clarification of terms. Uh, so the first, the, the purpose of, of tonight really um, if you were to sum it up, it's, I want us to evaluate individually how we approach people in the LGBTQ plus community um, and, and how, how we have been, how we probably, maybe we should. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm not saying that, you know, everything that we do is wrong. But I want us to go, to go over, you know, some of those things some of those things that we believe that we maybe haven't thought about in a while that we just assume and operate by and really see with a fresh set of eyes uh, what, is, is this right? Is this really the best way to do things? Um, so with that, I think there's, there's two ways I'm going to go about that in the time that I'm talking. And the first is understanding the terminology that we're using today, um, that people are using today. I think that this is important. Because uh, if you don't understand what people are saying, either either there's going to be, we're saying things to them and they're saying things to us, and we think they mean one thing and they really mean another thing, and they think we mean something that we really don't mean, or they're going, the other part of this is there's terminology that you maybe have never heard before. Um, so people are, are saying words and you're like, what? What does that mean? You know, I don't understand this at all. So there's that. And the second thing that I want to do is look at how Jesus interacted with the marginalized groups in his time and see if we can take some cues um, from the Bible in that aspect. So the first thing, uh, like I mentioned before, is, is terminology. And that's, like, I think that's important because we need to make sure we're not, you know, missing missing on that. Um, it's, it's a way to, learning the terminology, like I said, helps with effective communication, making sure that, you know, we're doing our best to understand and be understood by the people that we're, that we're interacting with. And it's also a good way to show some respect to those people, um, to say, you know, like, you're worth the time that it takes to learn all of, all of these new words and all of this stuff. Um, yeah, so I think the first thing I'm going to do is pass out. Uh, could you guys help me pass these out? <coughs> One of the resources that um, is on that list is called Guiding Families. And this is this what, I'm, what they're passing out right now is just, um, it's called the Key Terms page from that. And, and that book is really, it's geared at uh, helping, well, it says, it's geared at, it's, so it's guiding families of LGBT plus loved ones for every pastor and parent and all who care. So it, it's, it's guided at gearing churches towards um, understanding and being able to relate you know, to um, people in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and this book is actually available at Home Point, I believe. So you can buy this. And it's good. I've, I've perused it a bit. And it's, yeah, I've enjoyed it. So just kind of looking through some of these different things, um, like acceptance is probably, the bait and switch is one that was new to me. Um, 
So it occurs when intentions, beliefs, or attitudes are initially misrepresented and later found to be different than expected. An example would be expressing a love for LGBT plus people only to later disclose a significant aspect of belief that was not clearly communicated earlier. Um, just things like that, um, that's more, more of you know, a trap that I think we can fall into, something to be aware of. Um, but at the bottom of the first page, they've got like lesbian, um, gay. So the interesting thing about gay, I think, especially that, that word in terms of, in terms of our uh, church culture today, what we, that's one of the big ones that we, we have a meaning for it, and then the community, the LGBT community has a meaning for it that are not the same. So when we say gay, like what, what do you think, what is your definition of like gay? When you think gay, like um, this isn't rhetorical, like if someone, what's somebody's definition? Happy. <laughs> I just think it's someone who is attracted to the same sex. Yeah. Whether male or female. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, so when we think of gay, we think of like sexual orientation. Right? It's, it's just who, who you're attracted to, um, the gender that you're attracted to, if you're attracted to the same gender. Um, but in, in the LGBTQ plus community, when people say gay, it's a lot more about your identity um, and who you are. And, and sexual orientation is tied into that, but it's, it's, not, you know, it's not just that. So an example of where this could be, you know, this is important to note the difference is, if you're talking to someone and, you're, and you say, you know, I think being gay is wrong, um, what, you're saying, what, what you're saying is I think, like, you could be thinking, I'm, I'm saying, I think homosexual behavior <coughs> is wrong. What they're hearing is, like, my identity, like, some, some of the most core parts of who I am is wrong. Um, and that's just, that's, that's something that, you know, we need to know the difference um, on. Yes, um, so then like bisexual, someone who's attracted to more than one gender. Um, transgender describes a person whose internal sense of gender identity does not correspond with their birth sex. Uh, let's see. Um, one that I was not familiar with really until um, like a year or two ago probably um, is cisgender. That is just Cisgender describes a person whose internal sense of gender identity corresponds with their birth sex. Um, so that's just that's a term that you might hear, but be like, I'm not entirely sure what I mean, what this actually means. Um, <clears throat> there's so same sex attraction um, sa or same gender attraction. This term is common for those who consider attractions toward the same gender to be a sin struggle. Yet it is offensive to many LGBT plus people because it has behavior connotations and diminishes the identity aspects of sexual orientation. Many LGBT people prefer the term same gender loving. This is an example of um, a term, uh, uh, a word that has, it's more the connotation than the direct definition, because um, this, this term is used a lot more by like, um, like pray the gay away people, like doing conversion therapy, um, those people who are trying to change your gender, so it has a much that has a much more negative connotation to people in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so something things like that to be aware of, um, along with like calling someone homosexual is like not really a very nice thing to do, because um, that also kind of has some of those same connotations. And it's not so much that that those connotations aren't true. But it, it's it's an, in an effort, you know, to to reach and relate to those people well, to not use those those terms, you know, that people find offensive. Um, yeah. So this is this is something to just a lot of this is just like perusing, you know, uh, on your own time. Um, I found this this is one of my favorite parts of that book, uh, just because it's I think a lot of a lot of useful information and really packed in there. <clears throat> so, do we have any questions about anything thus far? So, are you indicating then that 
the term homosexual is kind of like the N word that, that we, we should that should not be used because it's offensive to them. I mean, is that I, I think it's not not like to the same degree, but yes, yeah, it, yeah, yep. So. The other big thing um, that I discovered when I started learning about this stuff is, especially in, in the world of um, gay people in the church, there's some differing theologies um, to be aware of, and there's some like jargon to those theologies. I don't know if you've heard of like side A, side B theology. I didn't know what that was at all until like I started reading these books and stuff. Um, but I'll, I'll just go over a couple different um, definitions that I got from a, um, a site called Q Christian um, that is probably, as I'll explain later, it's, it, it is a side A leaning um, website organization. So it, it's more of the definitions that people who um, agree with or think that same-sex relationships are correct. It's more from that that perspective, but I think it's good to know, I think there's value in understanding other people's definitions um, so you can know like what, what they mean when they're saying these things. So I don't necess necessarily agree with all of the wording of these things. I would maybe put some of it a little bit different, but I think it's, it's good to see like, or, or to, to be aware of like, this is how these people are thinking about it. Again, so you can communicate better with these people. Um, so from their website, they they split they they split it into four different basic theologies: um, two non-affirming theologies and two affirming theologies. So the first non-affirming theology um, the, it affirms the existence of LGBTQ plus identities, but adheres to a traditional view of marriage and sex as designed for one man and one woman. And this version requires that LGBTQ plus persons remain celibate and is a conviction imposed upon others by cisgender heterosexual persons. So that's, that's their definition for the first. Um, the second non-affirming LGBTQ or non-affirming theology on this issue, it, it views um, LGBTQ plus identities themselves as apparent, disordered, or in some other way illegitimate and therefore inherently outside of God's approval and blessing. This view implicitly or explicitly supports efforts to alter someone's sexual orientation or gender identity through conversion therapy practices, and is sometimes referred to as side X or ex-gay ideology. Side X uh, slash ex-gay ideology is both dangerous and medically discredited. What was the first one called? Uh, just one. <laughs> Just one and two. So they didn't put names to their non-affirming theologies. Um, and then, like, side A and side B theology falls, um, according to Q Christian, under affirming theology. So their definition of side A theology, um, which is what I think they uh, more closely hold to, the, the theology that, as an organization, they're closer to, um, is any theology which fully affirms both LGBTQ plus identity and same gender sex. Side A theology fully affirms same gender relationships, marriage, and sex as good and acceptable to God. Side A theology also recognizes that celibacy may be freely chosen for many reasons, including by individuals who identify along the spectrum of asexuality. Individuals within this theological framework may hold a broad range of sexual ethics. Uh, side B theology, then, to contrast, is any theology which affirms LGBTQ plus identities, yet maintains that Christians should refrain from same, ge same gender sex for a variety of personal and or theological reasons. This includes single celibate LGBTQ plus Christians, as well as those in celibate partnerships and mixed orientation marriages. Mixed orientation marriages, if you don't know, is just when like some, it's basically like if somebody is gay, like a man is gay and he marries a woman. It, it's really interesting, I mean, there's a lot more to get in, into that. I don't understand it that well, but that's, that's what that is. Um, 
These are marriages, oh, oh, yeah, where in at least one person is married to a person of a differing sexual identity. Within the Q Christian Fellowship community, side B refers to a theological viewpoint reserved for LGBTQ plus persons only. When celibacy is imposed by cisgender heterosexual people onto others, it is referred to as non-affirming. So, side B theology, to me, sounds a lot like the first non-affirming theology, where it recognizes um, that, that, that identity, that it's an identity, but it affirms a traditional sexual ethic. Um, it's interesting to me when I was first reading this that they had that little bit on the end. So when celibacy is impo in, imposed by cisgender heterosexual people onto others, it's non-affirming. But when it's, when it's um, that theology is held by people within the community, it is affirming. And to me, at first I thought, like, well, that seems very, you know, contradictory. Like, what? But the more I learned about it, side A theology and side B theology are, those terms and those theologies are coming more from people within the community. So, like, side A and side B are, are sides that people within the community take. So it's kind of an, an outgoing perspective, if that makes sense. Um, so it's not so much about, um, in that sense, it's not so much about like excluding cisgender people. It's just those those are theologies more for people within the community than outside of the community. Um, so that's just an interesting little thing. So the second main thing that I wanted to do tonight um, was look at what uh, what Jesus does. Um, Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah, it was just so if you're not part of that community, then you can't really have any position other than a, what were the first two? A non-affirming one. Yes, yes. Did you repeat the question for those who couldn't hear? Yeah, so Evan said, <laughs> asked, um, if you're not in the community, then it seems like you can't have an affirming theology, unless you have a side A theology. That would be affirming, kind of. I mean, you, if you agree with side A theology. Yeah. I, it, it's, you know, it, it's an interesting. Where, um, you think the, the sexual practices are okay too? Mm -hmm. Here's how I did it. It's good. Yeah. Right? Oh, no. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there's um, there's affirming and non affirming. That's kind of what you're after, right? Yeah. Non affirming. And then you've got side A and side B. The B, it's not, it, they didn't designate side B for this. I just do it in my own head. That helps me remember it. B-I-B-L-E, Bible. Side B holds to a traditional ethic and sexual orientation within the marriage. <coughs> That's what side B does. You cannot be affirming if you're outside of the community at all, correct? Unless you're on side yeah. A. Unless you're on side A. Yeah. And that's the only way you could be, that's the only way that you could be outside of the community is if you're, in a, if you're in an affirming position. And to come back to your question about the N-word, um, I'm from Missouri, so I can say Missouri. You're not from Missouri, <laughs> so you have to say Missouri. And I think there's a little bit of that kind of mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. with the word homosexual. Misery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 So, yeah. not to hijack it, but just to clarify what you said at the beginning of this, this is their affirming yes. perspective. That's that's what I was going to touch on too. Yeah. So I agree with with what uh, Steve said, and just yeah, to add on and and reiterate, it is it is um, their definitions. So like I said, I don't necessarily agree with. Everything and, and it doesn't necessarily all make perfect sense, um, but just understanding kind of where they're coming from on that. Um, um, hold on one second. So can you clarify a little bit more what you mean by identity? What's involved with that? And then also affirming what? What do you mean by when a person affirms someone of this of the LGBTQ community? Yeah. Well, affirming is just supporting. Um, Ally. Yeah, like an, an ally, um, someone who, who's saying, like, this is good, this is right. Um, 
and, and you know, it, it's 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 another one of those things that like I may think I'm affirming, but other people would say I'm not affirming. Um, but to to the community, I think affirming is generally condoning in full um, their actions and their beliefs and their identity. And identity, what I mean by that is it's so it's part of who they are. Um, it's not just this is who I'm attracted to. It's this is a part of what makes me me. If that makes sense. And that's why it's so personal. And that's why it's so personal and can be so abrasive and offensive, you know, to, to say that like homosexuality is wrong because you're not just saying like I think like acting on the desires that you have is wrong. You're saying I think like who you are is wrong. Why do they think that it's part of who they are? And or why is it part that's, I don't I don't understand. Different question. Different yes, question. That's, yeah, that's, 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 like, like, that's loving yeah. number one or two. That's yeah. <laughs> that's, that's four say, hours later. For the person that says I'm heterosexual, that's who I am. And for you to say that that's not who you are is like for for somebody to tell you that 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 isn't really who you are. That's not your identity. Then it's, if you say it to them, they're saying, they're saying the same thing from the opposite side. Yeah, yeah. So you could look at it like that. Yeah, like if um, what Gary was saying is it's like if you think like if you tell a heterosexual person that that's not who they are, you know, like that they should be gay or something. It's kind of the same thing, like our sexual orientation is a part of us. And especially, I think part of it, yeah, uh, I see your, see your hand. I think part of it um, for people in the gay community can be if, if you're kind of isolated from the rest of, of your community and you're alone, um, and this is such a point like of, of contention or a hard like part in you, especially if you grew up in a Christian home, you know, this can be a really hard thing. Um, that can can really embed if you accept that you know it becomes really important to you because it's going to affect a lot of things about your life. Yeah. I think that even with the heterosexual comment, I think that still goes back to you as a heterosexual are identifying as your sexuality, like you are a heterosexual. A gay individual is not identifying their sexuality; they are identifying them. So by using the term heterosexual, you're still using a sexual term or saying. <laughs> an individual that's from the community that is like saying being born with brown eyes is wrong. Yeah. Right? It's it's a birth thing, not an and and so it's a part of their identity, not a part of their sexual preference. So I think the heterosexual still leans into this is my sexual preference in identity, whereas someone that states they are they are gay for us, we are identifying it as their sexuality. Mm -hmm. For those in the community, they are identifying it as I have brown eyes and that's how I was born, so I'm not wrong because that's how I was born. So it's a, truly their, one of their identifying factors, like we have on driver's license, mm -hmm. not, not a sexuality <coughs> Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like when they say that I think we can miss, you know, there's, that's like, Sexual orientation is kind of the tip of the iceberg of that statement, and then there's there's all of this, you know, that we're just skipping. What's the difference between three and four? Three and four. <coughs> Side of in your in your definition. Oh oh on okay between. So you mean between the two non-affirming? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the first, the first um, non-affirming view of theology is it it affirms that LGBTQ plus identities exist, that that's a valid identity, but it holds to a traditional sexual ethic. So it's still saying that I think that um, sex and is is reserved for marriage in the context of marriage between one man and one woman. The second non-affirming um, theology, it, it says it doesn't recognize it. It doesn't recognize LGBTQ plus identities as valid and is mo is more. It leans more towards um, viewing um, homosexuality as a disorder or something that's wrong with the person that needs to be fixed. Um, which is where you get conversion therapy and like the, the pray the gay away people trying to change people's sexuality and orientation, um, which is 
a whole other thing in and of itself. Um, does that make sense? So you talk about what is there a three and a four? Is what is that? There's not. So it's their their definitions are kind of weird because it kind of goes non-affirming one and two, and then affirming a a side theology and b side theology. You have one over here too. I would just say the best way to think about it when you think about them taking it on as our identity is it would be as if someone was attacking your identity. Yeah. If someone were to attack your own identity in Christ, then they feel they feel that so deeply as we feel that our identity is, is in Christ. That's that's what they feel. You know? So think about it like that. You think how deeply they feel that attack. Um, that's how deeply they feel that identity. Yeah, yeah. Especially for, um, yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, did everybody, did everybody get that? I didn't shout. Go ahead and repeat it. So basically what she said was, you can liken it to your faith in Christ. If someone was, was calling out your faith in Christ the way um, someone might call out someone's sexual identity. It's, it's that, for a lot of people, it's that closely tied to who they are. That it, it's really kind of, you know, ripping at the roots. <clears throat> Uh, any other questions or comments or clarifications or anything? Cool. The second part um, of what I wanted to talk about, which is looking at, at the Bible and, and what cues we can take from that. Um, and I'm going to focus on Jesus' example um, with Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 1 through 10. I forgot to bring my Bible, so I'm going to forget. All right, so I'll just go ahead and read through the whole thing um, and talk about it. So Luke 19, uh, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Um, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. All right. So, uh, something to note. Like, I, I want to give a little bit of context at certain points in this. Uh, something to note right away, which I'm sure most of us are already familiar with some of the context of this story, um, but tax collectors were a despised group among the Jews at the time. Um, for really two reasons. Uh, one, even though they were Jewish, they worked for the Romans, um, and some Jews believed that it was wrong to pay taxes to the Romans, and obviously you don't tend to love the person who pays tax, like who collects your money. <clears throat> and then two, they often abused their positions of power by taking more than they were required to collect, because the, the Rome, Rome would say how much they were supposed to collect yearly, but they might exceed that amount and tell people that they really needed more. <clears throat> and one way to think of this and in, in, in how the Jews, because the, the comparison between um, this story and what we're talking about isn't, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, so I'm not trying to make this a one-to-one -one comparison, but I think there's a lot of similarities between um, how the culture treats the LGBTQ plus community today and how the culture, the Jewish culture, or I'm talking about church culture, in terms of modern day, and then how the Jewish culture um, treated tax collectors in that day. 
And then also how Jesus interacted with those people in light of all of these factors. So a, a, a modern day equivalent, I guess, to, to how the people thought about tax collectors um, in their day, how the Jewish people thought about tax collectors, would be kind of how we think about a child molester or a rapist in modern day, you know? Because in some ways, you know, people might, th Jewish people might think these tax collectors are like raping our country, you know? They're working for the Romans, they're helping the Romans take our stuff from us, you know, enslave us and, and such. So it's, it's that sort of a connotation, um, pretty harsh, you know, they're pretty horrible people. Um, <clears throat> The interesting thing to note, too, though, is that technically tax collectors weren't outside of the Jewish law in doing what they were doing. So Zacchaeus wasn't necessarily sinning in being a tax collector. Now, he, wasn't, he was not liked by the people, but he wasn't necessarily sinning, which is where this, you know, this isn't a perfect analogy. Like, there's no such thing as a perfect analogy, but so this isn't entirely a, the same comparison um, but he did associate, you know, with people who disregarded the law. And there's, there's the, the possibility that, he, you know, he was doing, he was sinning in his job, like he was taking money, stealing money and stuff. But it's, it's not, the job of tax collector in and of itself isn't necessarily uh, outside of Jewish law. It's not necessarily against Jewish law. Just a good thing to note. Um, <clears throat> So just as tax collectors were, were a marginalized group, and when I say marginalized, I mean um, any person or group that's kind of on the outside um, of a culture or treated as insignificant. Uh, so just as tax collectors are, were a marginalized group in Jewish culture, the LGBT community is often a marginalized group in church culture. So there's, there's kind of, there's some similarities, like I was saying before, between how church culture views gay people today and how Jewish culture viewed tax collectors. So in terms of how people were treating Zacchaeus, there's, there's some similarities between how he was received by people. So getting a little bit of that context um, under our belts then, what, uh, what messages is Jesus sending um, to the people? I think there's, there's really two things that Jesus is doing. He's, he's, he's doing one action, but it's saying things to, to two different groups of people. He's talking to um, the individual, to Zacchaeus, and also to the culture, to the people who are watching this. Um, I don't think that, I think he's, he was probably cognizant you know, of both of the things that were happening. So it wasn't just that he was focusing on Zacchaeus and ignoring the people around him. He was aware of how they're going to respond and how they're going to see this. <clears throat> so culturally, um, to the people watching, um, it, it's really a, it's a big deal, you know, to go to go to someone's house. That's a really um, intimate, close, close thing. Um, it's really like really associating with that person like this is my friend this is my my person um, it's it's sort of the modern equivalent of like going to a gay wedding you know in terms of how the culture was viewing this like he's going to he's going to this sinner's house and hanging out with them it's kind of like they're going to this gay wedding like what and I'm not saying don't hear me saying that you need to go to like the gay weddings I'm not I'm not saying that but I'm saying there's there's culturally, it, it's it's seen that's there's a similarity there between between how it's viewed doing those two things in their respective cultures. Individually, um, Zacchaeus, like how how Jesus is is interacting with Zacchaeus, like I was saying, what he was doing, going to someone's house, spending the night at their house, is a very close, in, intimate thing. Um, Jesus was not afraid of risking being misunderstood by the culture to be understood by the person that he loves. Because he, like, he wants Zacchaeus to know that like, like I'm, I'm associating with you, like let's go hang out, like, let's go do this thing. Like, I'm, like if modern day equivalent, if you're going to a gay wedding, you know, you're saying like I'm celebrating this moment in your life, you know. Um, 
And, and so this, this story has kind of twofold impact. One in how, how the culture sees it. Um, so how, how Jesus interacts um, on a cultural level and then also like how Jesus interacts on an individual level. So how we should interact on an individual level with people. Um, he associated with people and he built relationships. Um, and I, I just think, you know, like it needs to be said that it, it's not condoning somebody's sin to have a genuine relationship with them. I think that's, I think that's really one of the most important things. Um, like one of the things, like I, if you get nothing else out of tonight, like one of the things I, would, I want you to know, or, or like one of the things that I really believe the church should be doing is forming relationships with people in the, in the gay community and, you know, non-binary community, the, all, the whole thing. <clears throat> so, um, really, like, my, my main takeaways from, from this um, passage is, is Jesus looked uh, beyond, not past people's sin. So he wasn't ignoring, you know, like what, what we do when we do wrong things. But, but he's able to look past that and accept people anyway. And like I said before, this isn't a one-to-one -one comparison. So it's like, unlike Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus wasn't necessarily sinning, being a tax collector. Um, but when we apply this, you know, more to our day, and also when you look at how the culture viewed him, according to culture, he was sinning. Um, but Jesus like went after him just the same. Um, and yeah, there is, but there is like to be aware that, you know, it, there's a little bit of a difference, you know, like, especially when it comes to today, um, like when we're talking about the LGBTQ plus community, um, the basis, the, the base of that community, you know, we think, we believe, at least I believe, is um, like on homosexual acts being okay, which I don't agree with. So there is sin there, not necessarily with Zacchaeus, I and mean, we don't know for sure if he was actually doing wrong or not, but something to be aware of. Um, so Jesus, um, when, when we're looking at this, kind of some of the things that, that I've pulled out of this um, is, and, and how, how we should how we should approach um, interacting with the gay community is we need to shift the focus of our conversations when we're talking about this topic. Because um, in the past, um, on, on the semi-rare occasions that I have heard this, this um, topic being broached in the church, it's usually on an issue of the morality and, and trying to prove you know, whether or not the Bible actually says homosexuality is wrong or homosexual acts are wrong. Um, and I think we need, especially when we're talking with people and, and interacting with people in this community, we need to shift the focus from the law, you know, whether or not it's right to, to love and, and forming relationships with people. <clears throat> not, not to disregard the law, because that is important, and truth is important. Um, but I think truth, I think truth is a part of perfect love. And if, if we're trying to love people, truth, truth is a part of that, but love is, it, it exceeds the bounds of truth, if that makes sense. So truth is held within perfect love. You can't have perfect love without truth, but love is greater than truth itself, if that makes sense. Um, one, a, a little quote, there was a chapel speaker last semester, um, who talked about a similar sort of thing, and one of the things that he said that I immediately wrote down in my notebook um, was, our truth will not be heard until our grace is felt. So this, that's probably the main, re the main thing, I, the problem I have with like street evangelists, is you can't tell people, I don't think you can really have a, a beneficial impact on people, at speaking truth into their lives, until you have a real relationship with them and they know that you love them. And I'm going to read um, just a little section. Say that phrase one more time. Our truth will, the quote from oh, the truth. Our truth will yes. not be heard. Our truth will not be heard until our grace is felt. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm going to read just a little bit from one of the books that's on that resource list, Single Gay Christian by Gregory Coles. Um, <coughs> this is, he's having a conversation with one of his friends, um, and they're talking about um, truth and, and love and kind of how you, how you talk, like speak those things. And his, so it starts with his friend talking. Um, and he says, it's offensive any time you call someone out on their sin, he objected. I don't like it when people call me out on my sin, but sin is sin. If we love people, we'll call it out even when it hurts. And then Gregory Coles responds, but if you really love someone, I asked, wouldn't you try to find a way of expressing that love that they would be able to recognize as love? If you don't care how someone else hears the words you're saying, then you're speaking for your own benefit, not for theirs. That doesn't sound like love to me. And that kind of comes back to, you know, the question that, that had been forming in my head this last year with, with all of my friends at school. Is like, how do I love the people that I care about in a way that they recognize as love? Can you give us more context on the book? The book? Okay, so Single Gay Christian. <laughs> I, I don't love the title. It made me not want to read the book <laughs> from the title. I thought, like, that's kind of weird. Um, but I really, really like this book. Uh, so Gregory Coles is um, a man who identifies as a gay Christian. Um, so when he says gay, what he's meaning is not, it, it's part of identity. But another thing that goes along with that, uh, when a lot of, like, especially when you're having this conversation of homosexuality in the church with people who are, um, like, same-sex attracted, in the church, who are, who are also Christians, um, they might identify as gay, and what they mean by that is just, like, it's part of their identity, and it's their sexual preference. Um, so to them, gay does not equal um, sexual behavior. Does that make sense? So it's not about, like, if they're having sex with someone of the same gender, it's more about their sexual preference. Um, so that's that's kind of how you get people who say I'm a gay Christian, and you know, like it's a little, that seems a little funny. Like that doesn't sit right, but yeah. So could you identify sexual preference then? That's what I'm having trouble with. Desire. Like desire. If you said that they don't identify it with a sexual act with the same gender, it, it's about. They don't participate in the activity yeah. sexual intercourse with that other. But they're attracted but to they're that. But they're attracted to them. Like they're attracted to a... So they want to be just with members of the same sex? No. 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 Sex. They have the temptation. It's, it's the same temptation and action. Separate those two things. If it, you can think of it just like, I mean, like a, a regular person. Like, I have the desire to have sex with a woman. That doesn't mean that I'm going to do that outside of marriage. Does that make Got sense? It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's just, it's that sort of thing. So... People, there's, um, yeah, and that, that kind of comes back to the, the side B theology, that, which is what, what Gregory Coles, I think, holds to. He, didn't, he doesn't say so explicitly, but um, the idea that you can have an identity that, yes, like I'm, I'm acknowledging that I um, have, the, like, my sexual preferences towards people of my same gender, um, and I identify that, that that's part of my identity, but I still hold to a traditional sexual ethic that sex and marriage are for one man and one woman. So they're living with this in the church, that mm -hmm. subset of people. Mm -hmm. They're sure. just acknowledging yeah. it, my it desire preference, preference, not action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so it's, it's acknowledging the desires they have and accepting that that's the desires that they have, but not acting on it necessarily. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, another thing um, that I think uh, would be good is, is to realize that some of the obstacles that we run into when we're trying to bring gay people <coughs> into the church um, are the result of poor stewardship of straight sexuality in the church. Um, like, idolatry of marriage. Um, the the church sometimes seems to promote marriage as the end goal for everybody, 
in that you're not like you're not a whole person until you're married or um, you know singleness is really just the waiting time for before you find someone to get married because of course everybody has somebody out there for them you know that there of course like there's someone for you to get married if you don't get married it's just because you did a bad job like looking or like they walked by and you missed it and like you know it but but every it, it's that idea that you know everybody's supposed to get married and and when when you have a church that says that um, on one hand and then also says you know traditional sexual ethic marriage is only for one man and one woman and then you have someone um, who's a Christian or or coming into the church that you're trying to bring to Christianity or to Christ um, who is gay how do you tell them you know like how, how do you navigate that like yes everyone is like the end goal for all straight people is to get married it's this glorious thing you're not a complete person until it happens but you're gay and and we don't think you should get married to someone of your sexual preference so you're kind of just in the middle if that makes sense um, and there's and another. If I can, there yeah. is one more other option in the community, which is not often approached, but a, a gay girl, good God, is another good book. Um, and she she is same gender attracted. Yes, but, Jackie Hill Perry. Yes, yeah. Jackie Hill Perry, right? Um, but she didn't believe that's what God had for her. She she knew that it was wrong. You know, she had walked a homosexual lifestyle before coming to Christ for quite a few years. She came to Christ, and she was like, yep, this is, I can't do this anymore. But she also wasn't attracted to men. Um, but three years of this prayer and Holy Spirit, I would say she did end up marrying a man, and they have multiple children, and she's um, a speaker. She's a public speaker, um, does a lot of education on the topic, and has a couple books now. So it, I think a conversation that sometimes we skip around too, is just because there's a desire doesn't mean it has to be acted upon. And if the Lord still can show you someone else, right? Like, mm-hmm. I would say I I work in a community um, where there are there's a lot of attraction to everybody, right? But that doesn't mean I'm going to encourage you attraction to everybody. But should I say that you should never get married either? No, it's not that there's not a temptation, right? Um, for an alcoholic, there's still temptation, but that doesn't mean that you should drink. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you should shut yourself in a room for the rest of your life by yourself. Either. <laughs> I think it's important to note, though, too, we shouldn't promote the idea is just because you're not married, you're not broken. Correct. You that don't have just it. because you're not married doesn't make you a broken person or that you just failed in life because you didn't get married. Yes. I, I, that's exactly. part of what you're saying. Right? Yeah, yeah. In yes. a way so that, singleness. Yeah, and I, I have a little bit, too. a little bit more to say on that. But I was going to ask you, is is that an example of like a mixed orientation marriage? Yeah. yeah. Is she she's still yeah. not attracted to him at all, but she married um, she, <laughs> <laughs> It's not probably the best way to. Uh, yeah, I can't really spread this yeah, yeah, she does a good job. It's highly recommended. She does. If you can listen to an audio book, you do better than actually reading it. Probably, but she does a really good job of walking through her struggle of when she knew that God called her to marry this man. But she didn't want to because physically she just wasn't there, um, and so she walks you through that process of um, the prayer that they went through together, the prayer that she did individually because she knew that this was a union, this marriage um, was what God called them to be. But she was struggling with not being there, and she gets there eventually. I think she probably struggles with it every day, um, but it was a long process. So I do think there's attraction there. What, was his, what was his thought in this? I mean, did, he know, <laughs> did he know what he was walking into? Yes. He, he did. He did. Okay. He yes. didn't know what he was walking into. They have four kids now, and they're very happy, and she's an extremely active advocate for this kind of stuff. And, um, yeah. But yeah, yes. it, it's a process. It's not It's complex. It's not easy. Like, with any yes. Yeah, and that's a good, um, that's a good, like, yes, I'm glad, I'm really glad you guys brought that up. Um, Because that kind of illustrates, like, this isn't a black and white issue at all. Like, there's a lot of gray, and, like, people come to different places, and God calls different people to different places. Just, like, just because God, just because you're gay doesn't mean God's telling you to be celibate, like Jackie Hill Perry. But that also doesn't mean that 
just because you're gay, God's telling you to marry someone of the opposite gender that you're not attracted to. You know, so it it's different for everybody um, in what the the their trajectory of their life um, and God's plan for them is, um, and it's not. It's not, it's very complex, I guess. It's just, yeah, what I wanted to say with that. If it's easy, everybody just do it right to get it. <laughs> no, we'd still get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, so another thing that I wanted, I wanted to read another bit out of this um, that kind of talks a little bit about that in, in terms of um, celibacy for, for the gay Christian and how that interacts with, um, you know, the church. Um, so he, this is him just writing. Uh, but the road of celibacy for the gay Christian remains a distinctly complex calling. To not only resist sexual urges, but to try and banish the thought of ever fulfilling them. To have no daydreams of a future romance, no wistful marriage plans. To feel like the very core of your sexual desire and faith you hold most dear, so that the very core of your sexual desire and the faith you hold most dear are at odds with each other. There are sufferings far worse than this, but there is none quite the same. <clears throat> My heart has its own fracture lines, its own unique ways of breaking. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe the calling to gay Christian celibacy, celibacy stands in 21st century America as a precious reminder of just how desperately, helplessly devoted we were meant to be to the cross of Christ. A reminder that the sacrifice we make will pale in comparison to the sacrifice made on our behalf. And here's really kind of the main point of this. Um, maybe the problem isn't that faith costs some of us too much, but that it costs all of us too little. Um, and that, that's kind of what I'm getting at with this like poor stewardship um, of marriage and of heterosexual sexuality um, creates problems bringing gay people into the church. Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically that. Uh, Another thing that I would um, uh, encourage you to do is to like to do your research, um, to have conversations with people, um, like to have conversations with gay people, and to have conversations with people who um, are familiar with this topic, like Steve. Um, one of the things <laughs> we were we were talking about um, we were talking earlier like at the start of this about like what, what one of my favorite things was about this or unexpected things, I don't remember exactly what it was, um, about this internship this summer. And one of the unexpected things for me was how much, how, how ready Steve is for this conversation. And I, I would not have expected that um, from, and like part of that's on me, you know, like not going to him and asking him about these things. But I just, I just want you to know that, you know, Steve's ready for these conversations if you're interested in having them. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah. um, and then also, um, there's a lot of good resources on on that paper. Um, I really like this book. Um, there's a, a couple of YouTube links. Um, one's to uh, Vody Bachman, who if you aren't familiar is, I think, a Presbyterian? Uh, <coughs> no, no? Southern 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 SBC. Southern. Okay, he, he's, a, he's a pastor guy, I mean, he talks about this, and <laughs> Steve really likes him, and he's got some, some good things to say. Um, and then the other YouTube link is to a recording of um, Greg Johnson speaking at um, uh, the PCA assembly, the Presbyterian Church or something assembly, <clears throat> um, which is, it's, I don't remember all of the context to it, um, I might have to default to Steve. I think he remembers kind of the context to that. But he, it, it kind of started, I think, some of the conversations um, in America. Because it was kind of, whoa, what happened? Um, so just getting familiar, I think, with what, um, with that, with Greg Johnson and, and what he said then and what uh, the, the impact of that um, is. It's, it's good. It, it helps change your perspective. Um, another thing, the, really the last thing um, that I have, what, you just, were you yawning? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so the last thing that uh, I want to, to uh, encourage you guys to do, and this is really like, this is the, the in, in the, the question of the, like, loving your neighbor, how do we love our neighbor, um, 
form relationships. You know, if, if I could say like one thing, you know, really it's it's form relationships with these people, get to know these people. Um, it, that that's one of I think the best ways to to understand this topic is to know the people, um, and also that's you know that's really that that'll change your perspective um, for sure on things. It's it's one thing to know what you would say, like on the topic of homosexuality. It's another thing, you know, to, to have to say that to someone that you care about. Um, and, you know, forming relationships is how Jesus approached these things. Um, like with Zacchaeus, you know, he's going to, he's going to be with Zacchaeus to, to hang out with him, to spend the night. Um, with, with most of the examples of Jesus in the New Testament interacting with marginalized people groups of the time, um, he leads with building a relationship with them. He doesn't. He doesn't hit them with the truth. It's different for the Pharisees. You know, it's like how he interacts with people is different based on like some of the cultural things at the time. Like the Pharisees were the teachers. He's a lot harsher. Yeah. Um, are any of relationship isn't necessarily something that I struggle with? Um, I don't, don't say a word. But are any of these resources specifically like? So what I struggle more with is um, raising kiddos in a society where, in our church, it's still a taboo issue. In the school systems, in their age group, it's it's not any any I you can identify as anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's like, why is it a big deal? Um, it's more of that type of a conversation. Um, and then the second conversation that I often struggle through is when there's the extreme. The other end of the pendulum of um, from the church, well, if you're loving people well, love thy neighbor. Um, and then I have friends that are pastors that are marrying gay couples because, well, Jesus loves everybody, and so we should mm-hmm. love everybody. And so if they wouldn't get married, you know, we're condemning them not to. So those are like the extremes that I've had a little bit more of a struggle personally. And I didn't know if yes. any of these resources specifically addressed that, that I could be digging uh, for a starter. Yeah. Or do you have any other yeah, ones? Yeah. So for the first one, um, I don't know if this is what you were going to go to for the first one. Well, um, this is what I thought it was. Was this one okay. um, in terms of like talking with your kids about it? I think or understanding that because this is really geared towards it's geared towards pastors and it's geared towards parents. Okay. Towards usually it, it, the context of parents is parents of people of their children who are coming out or or issues like that more than just talking about you know, kind of the clash of church culture versus other culture in your home. Um, But I think this would maybe be a place to look for those resources. For the second... um, Excuse me, what what is this one? uh, Oh, Guiding Families. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Home Point. Yeah, first, yeah. Yeah, the one in Home Point, the one that you can buy for some amount of money. (laughs) Good plug. Yeah. (laughs) I get commission on that, right? <laughs> um, and and for the second, I I was kind of thinking, you know, I think it's just understanding um, the different perspectives on it, maybe. So I don't I don't know if there's one. You might have an idea for I've one specific. I've got a couple for you. Okay. Um, yeah, and really and some, before I throw a bunch of resources, like it's really important to understand. There's really not a silver bullet book. Yeah. So you really have to be a student of a lot of resources, okay? And so we'll save maybe some of that for a little later for our Q&A section. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is just make sure that Levi has ample time to, to close out his presentation piece, mm-hmm. and then we can move into that if we can. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I was, I was just about done. Um, yeah, but that, that reminded me of like something like I said earlier. Um, this isn't meant to be, you know, the solution to the topic, to the problem. Um, I don't, I don't think this is a problem. I don't think we should think of this as like a problem to be fixed. These people aren't a problem to be fixed. Um, but yeah, this this isn't this is, this wasn't supposed to be um, like an end all be all solution. I don't like you said. I there like there's no silver bullet book. I don't think there is one end-all, be-all solution to this. I think it's, like, it's just a, it's, you go, you know, I think you just have to get to know people, basically.
you know, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, I don't live on Facebook, but I do look at it occasionally. Mm -hmm. And today, there was a thing. Demi Lovato, who I couldn't tell you what song she sings. Apparently, <coughs> she's a rock star or something. Mm -hmm. But something. either earlier this year or last year, she, in this article, it was talking about how she was binary and non-binary, non -binary. and uh, she was, uh, she had termed herself as they and them, mm -hmm. but here just recently, and she said she was they and them because if she would go to a, a bathroom and it said men or women, she had difficulty determining which bathroom she wanted to go in on how she felt. But lately she's been feeling very feminine, so she has changed her term to she, she and her. And she put that out, and then somebody wrote an article on her, and she called the person a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. And my point behind all, what I'm talking about is, this keeps changing and growing, and if you don't keep up with mm -hmm. things, you're, you're going to have a difficult time trying to love somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Through this. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it is kind of, it is, it's the nature of, of culture, too, I think, that it's just constantly changing, in, and you have to, you know, sometimes it's really hard work to keep up with it. Yeah. I had a question. <clears throat> Has anyone had experience of someone who has uh, come out, <clears throat> but uh, there, there is an organization called Exodus, and they want people, or they're trying to get people to go. Has anyone had any experience with that? Um, do you want me to? Exodus is an Exodus. Is it out of Minnesota it's somewhere? It's conversion. It's conversion therapy. Okay. You want me to so, about it? Uh, yeah, yes. well, could you could you restate your question, though? I'm not sure I understood. I just was just wondering one. whether anyone has had experience oh, okay. of anyone yeah, yeah. So I, that I, I has, yes. whether it's been successful or whether it's not been successful. The ministry's been shut down. That's what I was wondering. And it was shut they down. They seem to kind of force. It was shut down force. about 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah. I haven't followed it, but I was aware of it. So in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, Exodus was fairly popular yes and it was the church's response to how to help and um, a lot of damage was probably done in that approach and so it's no longer a viable option the scary thing if you want to write this down you can put bill c4 that's the scary thing right now it's a legislative bill. It's a legislative bill that's international. It's not specific to the United States at this point. It's a Canadian bill that was just approved. What's the name of it again? It's By who? Bill C, like the letter C, numerical 4. And Bill C4 states that all conversion therapy is now illegal and can be prosecuted. Um, uh, which means that let's let's just say that let's say that Steve Rowland was gay, okay? And I told Don't <laughs> and I told our elders pray for me in this issue. The elders prayed for me, anoint me with oil, and they hold me quote unquote accountable. Now the Church of Rising Sun can be um, liable for damages. That's conversion therapy. That's what. That's as loose of a definition of conversion therapy as you'll find in Canadian law. So Exodus Ministries was the conversion therapy that churches used late '90s, early 2000s. Are you through with your presentation? I am. Yep. Okay. So before we go in, let me. Do Why is this a problem? Like. You, are, you started the whole thing with 
what's going to be a problem for the church in the next 10 years? Why is this at the top of the list? What, so let's make sure we're clear on definition. The problem is how the church has not responded. Okay, that's not what he said in the beginning. Yeah, that, that is, that's what we're, we're, we were, that's what we were aiming to say okay. at the beginning. Um, but the problem is that the church for years, and I mean Big C Church, right, right, right. Has, has really been pretty silent about this. And I think what Levi did tonight is an excellent way for us to at least kickstart this conversation. And so some of my hopes from what is birthed from tonight is dialogue. Because without saying it, I'm going to say it. Um, I know why a lot of you are here. Because you're trying to figure out, what do I do? There's a reason each of you are here. You guys care about this issue. And I think you should. Um, I, on a personal level, Cobes, like when I was a young man in college, I'll just briefly share my story. Um, I remember a college professor being in chapel, like Levi was this last semester, hearing something just remarkable that shaped my life. And he said, before he began his, his challenge to the kids, he said, I'd like you to take a people group or a person that, is, that you just, you, you don't think you could ever interact with, that you, you even hate. He used that word. And just write it down on a piece of paper. Just put it in your Bible for a little bit. We'll deal with it later. And I remember kind of going, I don't really hate anyone. I'm 17 years old. I'm 18 years old. And I, life's good. And so then I'm sitting there thinking, okay, well. Like, who's somebody you wouldn't stand, wouldn't want to be around? And I wrote the phrase homosexuals. Okay, I did. Northern Missouri kid. And it's 1997, a little different ballgame, right? So then, as I'm going through college, or as I'm going through this, this um, sermon, he starts to unpack Acts 1 8. He says, When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll have power, and you'll be my witness, you'll be my martyr in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. And he starts to Tell us what Jerusalem represents, and it represents your family, right? That's what, for the Jewish people, that's what Jerusalem was. Judea and Samaria, those are the people you couldn't stand. Those are the people you hate. And he said, now look at your piece of paper. It's interesting when we take the gospel to people that we, that we grow up with, that are our family, that know everything about us, that knew us when we were little people, that know all the wrongs that we ever did from five all the way up to, you know, 20, and we say, Jesus has changed me. Yeah, we'll see. Whatever, kid, right? I mean, that's kind of what happens. When you're able to do that, and then you're able to go to your enemy, the one that you can't stand, the one that you may hate, then you go to the rest of the world. That's what the gospel presentation is all about. And he said, some of you will end up going to Samaria. And I, I thought, nope, <laughs> I'm not even going into ministry, right? And what I've seen over the last 20 some years of ministry is God has slowly brought this community to me. I don't know why. It scares the heck out of me. And it started with one kid in youth group, and then it started with a best friend, or then it, it, it went into like a best friend that was gay. He was in a mixed orientation. I started to learn all this stuff, and then it was because I became really good friends with Jeff Brady. And I'm going, okay, it's 2022, game on, because the gospel is for everyone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. We have to do that well. So that's what I know you guys are here, right? And so the problem is that the church isn't, we haven't equipped each other. We haven't had the dialogue. That's what the problem is. Does that help you? Okay. May I just say that because of my generation, I'm probably the oldest person here tonight. No, not really. <laughs> wow! Wow! Called wow. him out. The problem was when we were raised uh, at that time, we didn't even hear the words homosexual or gay yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I was raised in a Christian, com basically Christian community. Yes. And we were church people, you know, and you were raised that way, and and so we had no. You, you, we had no... You guys whispered S-E-X. We didn't even talk about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there was no whispering. <laughs> well, that's true. I, mean, I know it's true. It was kind of a forbidden topic. It was. So, so that's why the church, uh, it's hard for us older ones 
to really I understand it because understand. we didn't grow up with it. Yes. We had no problem that way. Right. But now it's a whole different story with our children and our grandchildren. Can, Go for it. Can I? Yeah. Can I just say how encouraged I am, and I don't know about Levi and Joe, but I am as a young person to see, to see gray hairs, you know, here wanting yeah. to learn. What yeah. white hair <laughs> and some? There, there are some gray hairs over here, I guess. But but you wanting to learn and wanting to enter into the conversation is really encouraging for for us. So thank you for being here. Yeah. 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 Chris, go ahead. One of the reasons that I'm here tonight is, and I kind of echo what Mandy said. I work volunteer at the at the junior high schools in high school sewing costumes and fitting kids for show choir. And this is 2022, and January of 2022, I had to fit a dress on a 14-year-old boy at Stillwell Junior High in West Des Moines. And while I remained cool, calm, and collected, it was very unsettling for me. There's a lot of confusion going on in these kids who they are, what they are, who they want to be. And I, I struggle that they even know they're just kind of following the sheep over the cliff. And I, I just, I, and I have it at Southeast Polk in the junior high. I have it at the high school. And I just, uh, it's, it's hard. And you taught, you're, you did a great job with like. But, you know, talking it more in an adult perspective, I'm worried about these kids. Right. Yeah, yeah. I agree uh, with the, the, um, it, yeah, being unsettling. And, yeah, also, do they know what they're doing? Do they know what exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know if anybody answer that. So one, so one resource that I told me I'm going to push pause on. And actually, you brought it up. Go ahead and share with it. Me? Where yes. Okay. It's the Mama Bear sexual, uh, yeah. apologetic sexual so edition. Yeah, I actually know her personally. She wrote two books in the last couple of years. One was Mama Bear Apologetics. Yeah. That's her ministry. And apologetics is basically like the theology and the argument for standing in your faith mm -hmm. um, against what the world is throwing at you and teaching parents. Um, kind of right specifically towards moms, but it's for parents and equipping you to have conversations with your kids and um, talk about those discussions and those things that the world's going to throw at you as arguments for not standing from your faith. Right. Um, and teaching your kids that before the world throws at them. And she wrote another book um, just recently that is also Mama Bear Apologetics Guide to Sexuality Discipleship. Yeah, and it's really good. Um, my wife and I picked it up last year to read it, and um, we, we would highly recommend that for young parents. Um, if you want a real academic read when it comes to some of that, this one, this is really an interesting read. I would highly recommend this. It's kind of academic, just so you know. Um, Love Thy Body, and and it talks about some really hard things. Talks some really hard things. We're going to read those. Dang it, God. That's right. I'll give you, I'm going to fire you tomorrow anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Just one more thing on that. Uh, Mom of Fear Apologetics, that's also, she has a podcast yeah. that you can listen to as well. For sure. But part of, going back to kind of some of what Bob said, right, the, the conversation is so fastly moving and so heavily involved or heavily it's evolving. It's like a matter of uh, months or weeks almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. That 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 stuff is terminology is changing, and and in the conversation that we're having even tonight, just like you would do with anyone else, you would consider your audience, and it's interesting because when you think about the LGBTQ community from 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. Are there differences within those communities? You ain't a kid in there. So it's not a single lane road. That's why there's no silver bullet. 
So, so you really, you, you almost have to have a time machine as you're navigating some of this dialogue. And you have to know which audience you're talking to. Because they, I, I know this for a fact, there are old homosexuals who cannot stand what the new young homosexuals are doing. And they're like, God, oh, they're messing everything up. <laughs> okay, at least you and I agree on that. <laughs> right? And, at the same, and I would only say that with the, with the right people. Right? But at the same time, it is, it, there is kind of a tension between all of the information that's out there. Yeah, Jim. When I was there, I had never seen LGBTQ. So it's taken me a while to figure out what's going on. But we've considered homosexuality as a sin. Well, murder is a sin. Correct. Do we take the murders and say, well, now we're going to love you too? Absolutely. Should we? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If we love you, we ought to love them. We ought to love all of those people that we consider. Uh, Sinners because we are sinners. Mm -hmm. Preach. Yep. One of the thing, one of my favorite verses is Luke seven forty seven. Jesus was at his entertainment, and there was a certain Pharisee there by the name of Simon, and they were testing Jesus with the invitation. They brought a sinful woman to him, and she starts to weep. Her tears hit his feet. Her hair starts to brush. And Simon thought to himself, man, if this man really was who he said he was, he would not let such a woman touch him. Jesus knew what he thought. And he said to Simon, I have a question. <laughs> a certain money lender oh, um, lent two people two different amounts. One guy he lent about a month's worth of wages. The other guy he lent about a year and a half worth of wages. Neither could pay the money lender back. Which one loved um, oh, so he forgave the de debts. Which one loved the money lender more? And Simon said, I suppose the man who was forgiven much. And Jesus said, yeah, he was forgiven much, loved much. And he was forgiven little, loves little. So part of this interaction for me is putting myself against the cross, going, I know what I've been forgiven for. And if there's room for me at the cross, there's room for everybody at the cross. Too. It doesn't matter who you are. And really, that's what the church needs to be. If I have made contact, let's say, with the Holy Spirit, and work, he and I work together to see that I try to get stop this sin, or at least slow it down. Uh, the thing I learned tonight that I didn't know about this, yes, the Bible does say this is the wrong thing to do, but you have spoken in such a manner that I could say, well, if if you, you guys want to live in the same house together, I'm not going to say that's a sin. The Bible specifically indicates that it's if you have sexual intercourse with each other. Now, I don't know how I'm going to decide. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to put cameras in the bedroom? Or what? <laughs> so I better just say, I'm going to say there's no worse sin than that. The other issue, too, is that we are called, and, you know, as 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, flee all forms of sexual immorality, right? Even the importance of evil we should run away from. The Bible also said, it has a lot to say about who we were before Christ. Mm -hmm. So I think the way we treat people outside the church is way different than the way we treat people inside the church. And make it, people who claim to be Christians and claim Christ as their Lord and Savior, that we can speak into their lives that, that uh, truth and love, but outside is completely different. So you look at, I have a few verses here, like in Romans 6, 7, it says, one slave to sin. We are all slave to sin at one time in our lives, right? And then in Ephesians 2, 13, once lived in the passions of our flesh. You know, whatever that means for us, right? And then Colossians 1, 2, once we were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. So there's a, there's a past that we all have in here. And wouldn't it be fun to have it up on a screen so we all watch it? <laughs> no. It, we've been forgiven and wiped out. And I think that's what Steve's trying to say is that it doesn't matter what people, I mean, how complicated and complex that people can make sin. I mean, we can dream up anything. And the Bible talks about that as well. But it can be all wiped out. 
Jesus said, he was without sin, cast the first stone. Yeah. yeah. And it's not about throwing stones. It's about trying to have the same kind of compassion, grace, forgiveness, love mm -hmm. that Christ offers us with other people. Because ultimately, in the end, I'm only forgiven by the blood of Christ, and I can't do it for anybody else. But we're supposed to come alongside people as best we can mm -hmm. to try and help us be where God wants to be, wherever that is. And and, I, and if you're not there yourself, how are you going to help anybody else? Get let, let me do one thing here. Word? Are there questions? Let's do that. Are there questions? Before we start preaching. Right here. Yes. Sorry, John. Oh, hey, hey, do you have a question? Yeah, tell me if it's too deep for this. No. Like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I struggle with. I feel like I'm pretty knowledgeable on this topic. It's very near and dear to my heart. I struggle with the term gay Christian or lesbian Christian or things like this because that's putting, to me, that's putting an identity before your identity in Christ. And so. I want to know your opinions on it because I would just caution us when we're, when we're having these dialogues and we say he's a gay Christian. I wouldn't say I'm a brown haired Christian or I'm a white Christian, right? Hmm. So I just want to know your thoughts on that. It's this, but I would just caution us when we're having this conversation. Is it, are we going to just like you said define your terms? Are we going to are we going to adhere to that label, or are we just going to say they're a Christian? And that the Holy Spirit is working on those things with them. Great question. Yeah, can I touch on this a yeah, little bit? Yeah, I think we should all go through. Yeah, so so there's a lot of things there. So first off, I agree with you. There, there doesn't need to be any adjective that goes with Christian, right? But if I call you a female Christian, am I incorrect? No, but... Well, hold okay, on. Keep going, and okay. I'll go back. If I call you a brown-haired Christian, am I incorrect? No. All right, so those are both facts about you now someone's gonna say well hold on that's not a sin thing that's part of their identity right what if i say you're an american christian or a patriotic christian Is, would that be correct yes yeah you gotta get shot Wait, hold on. I'm not you're the a, a patriot let, let me ask roger roger would you say you're a patriotic christian i'm very patriotic okay <laughs> would would then maybe you don't, but yeah, yeah. here we go, right here. Um, there is a way of living out patriotism that is sinful in the fact that you put your country above your God and your country above your Christianity, and you put that as your God. And there's a way of living out being a patriotic Christian that's not sinful, where God says to seek the good of the place that you find yourself where God says to love your neighbor, right? And to, and to fight for those who are around you, right? So there's a way of living out being a patriotic Christian that it, it would be correct, and there's a way of doing that that's sinful. There's a way of doing that that's not sinful. That's what he's trying to say when he says, I'm a gay Christian. He's saying the attraction of the, the sexual orientation, the sexual preference we talked about earlier, that in and of itself is not the sin. Temptation is not sin, otherwise Jesus would not be sinless, and we would not be saved. So the temptation in and of itself isn't sinful. The acting out is sinful. And so what he's saying is, I am gay. That's, that's just true. There's a way of living out my gayness that is sinful, and there's a way of living that out that isn't sinful. And so, yes, I'd be beautiful. And, uh, right, Ab absolutely. And so, yes, I agree with you on your initial point. There is, There doesn't need to be any adjective next to Christian. We can just confidently say we're Christians. However, the way that the English language works, you can add other things to that, and it's not incorrect. There may be a way of doing it that's sinful, but there's also a way of doing it that isn't sinful. Let me speak to like maybe the, the purpose uh, of putting that adjective uh, in the front <clears throat> is... So, the, the gay community being a minority, especially in churches, um, it, it's not always the intention, but minorities, if they're not named, tend to be forgotten. So I think, sometimes at least, part of 
part of the reason we that adjective is it, people use that adjective. I'm a gay Christian. Is like I agree with what you're saying. Not to put their sexual preference over Christianity, but is to recognize that they're uh, they're in a unique place inside the church, and and it's useful to have that distinction um, within the church that we don't forget about those people and don't forget that there's a we have there's a unique way to love those people. If that makes sense. And to speak to the context of its use, it's the title. He's using it in the title of the book. And ty- book titles are supposed to be something that catches your attention. For sure, yeah. And communicates yeah. the purpose of the book. I just meant book. more yeah. as, a, as a whole, right. like as a are we... Yeah, he, he'd still identify as a gay Christian if he yeah. so. Not yeah, just on the book like, title. Sure. Are we going to... Is that kind of the term that we that we want to adopt and we want to use? Or are we wanting to say, like, they're a Christian who struggles with same-sex attraction? Mm-hmm. Or they are a Christian who is confused about their body? Or things like that. Yeah. I told you so it was deep. I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying I don't yeah, disagree with no. you, but those are things that, like, in my mind, that's where yeah. I'm so, battling with. So this, this is this is a thing that within the side B conversation, sure. yeah. they disagree on. Yeah. They agree that same-sex attraction is a thing. They agree that that living out your Christian or living living out marriage is only between a man and a woman, and any sexual activity outside of marriage is sinful. And so side B Christians all agree on that. There's kind of a delineation in this conversation. I think I disagree with Steve on this conversation. We've had it a few times before. But we're still able to communicate and understand each other because we have this conversation. right? And that's why we're all doing this. You don't have to agree with Greg or with me when I explain this concept. Uh, but you can understand it if we dialogue with each other. Good resource for this question in particular. Um, is that Greg Johnson, um, that bottom link on the resources, um, that's, that's him speaking to, to this, to this topic, too. So, I'm sort of, okay, I got friends who are lesbians. Yeah. I got gay friends. Yes. I got transgender friends. Yes. Um, I call them, I don't have bisexual, I know of, but I could have. <laughs> but when I came here, I did come for theology. Sure. What did you come here for? I came here to see is the church, the rising sun, planning on addressing somehow how do we approach this, this community? Uh, what are we going to do? Not just talk about, well, you know, this this is this way, this is that way, and uh, as a leadership thought about yes. addressing this situation, these people. People, they want to put it, you know. Before we do that, before we do that, because here, you know what? Rising Sun is not, it's not limited to Rising Sun leadership or staff. You know who Rising Sun is? Oh, well, it's the people. I it's that you but I'm and gonna, Jim. Okay, but what I'm saying so is, the point God. is, there has to be a collection, and there has to be a foundation, and dialogue within the body before collectively Well, if we we, it's that important that we have this get-together about this, mm-hmm. it should have been forethought about, you know, what, what, what's our plan on some of this stuff? What do we do? You know, I've got, I've got uh, lesbians in my family. Yeah. I have adopted my birth family. You know, they're I wonderful people. I do too. You know, I've got a good friend in California was gay, and his, his, his partner just separated after 30 years. Yeah. You know, he goes through a lot of stuff. I got another person out there that's transgender, and I didn't understand it, so we had a long dialogue about transgender. You know, it wasn't just like 15 minutes. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was a long distance, but we still had a long the first thing. thing but I'm, I'm just, you know, we can always talk about theology and all this sort of good stuff, but when, what's, what's the end result? Mm-hmm. Right now, the end result is nothing. No. Okay. If not, there's no end result, you know, is there going to be an end result? Hold on. Here's the, here was the goal for tonight. It's to begin the conversation. And we did that. And we're going to continue to do that. These conversations are not once and done, buddy. The fact that you guys are in a room right now, there's probably 40 or 50 of us, 
and now we have a shared collection of thought and a foundation of framework, we can start talking about now. Yeah, well, I, I think about it. I, I don't know how we have, at Rising Sun, have handled homosexuality in the past. Stuff that happened and how it was addressed and what the outcome was. I think I know what you're talking about. We can have that dialogue yeah. offline if you'd like. But I, I also. I, I'm just saying, we've got a history. Yes. Good or bad, whatever we call it. And I'm, I'm not worried about judging the history. So that's not my thing. But I, I did expect more tonight than sit down and talk about theology all night. I guess that's, that's where I'm at. But see, Art, there's a lot of people that, like Bernice said, I'm kind of there too. I was raised old school. I don't even know what half this stuff means. So I think you have to start with what does this stuff mean and get us all on board. Because you know, yeah. I lived in a box. You know, I, I mean, I know it's out there, but... This is all information that I probably haven't heard much before. The main I, action step is go love them. Go love people. Build relationships. Make those connections. And just start talking to people and try and gain their perspective and build that relationship. That, that sounds like a light action step, I guess, maybe. But it's something that a lot of Christians are really uncomfortable doing. I just want to say that um, I definitely was, if I'm not still, where you are. Like, what... Like that's that's why you know why, why we were having these conversations earlier because I came back from school feeling like like what is Rising Sun doing about this you know um, and yeah this is this isn't much of a of of a, a it doesn't feel like a lot of a start yeah it's not much of a how to it's not it, and it wasn't supposed to be like um, yeah like a sort of solution it wasn't you weren't supposed to have the answers when you left here um, it's supposed to be like here's I want, I want, uh, I wanted people to just see, like, this is something that needs to be addressed, which, which you already did. So I guess this is kind of a step behind where you already were, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to, like, more. I think, I think Joe hit the nail on the head. We are just talking about LBGTQ, but when you talk about sin, I mean, how many times are you uncomfortable? I'm uncomfortable in my neighborhood when I got a couple of neighbors that come over and they just want to talk with a filthy mouth. I'm uncomfortable with people that slander or gossip or lie. It's hard to approach those people and to love them. Mm -hmm. So this is just one issue. I still think it comes down to love. But, and, and how do we love? Mm -hmm. It's not easy for most of us. I've had, you know, worked with gay youth before, and, and basically, he we, we had a conversation, and he asked me about this or that, and I just said, my job is to introduce you to Jesus and have you fall in love with him, and then you need to figure some things out, you know. Yeah. You're going to have to figure some things out from there once you start understanding what the me his message was, you know, and what the Bible says. And so I, I said, well, I'm not here to judge you, but, you know, I'm here to introduce you to Jesus, mm -hmm. and uh, you got to fall in love with him. Yeah, it's never been our job to save yeah. people. Nope. Yeah. Or to fix people. You can figure it out. Joke. <laughs> <laughs> what were you talking about when you were talking about the Oh. oh. Yes, yeah, of course. Question, John? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I work with a lot of LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the area that I stumble the most is on the issue of gay marriage. Mm -hmm. And when one of the things that you said, kind of like, you know, really lit up the part where I struggle is like, how do you celebrate a gay marriage without condoning it? Someone else trying to I don't have the answer to this one. Sorry. Yeah, I tend to think of weddings as celebrations, like you're saying. Um, so it, it, I might disagree with Levi on this one, but Personal, well, okay. I won't disagree with him about this part. Pray and follow the Spirit. You pray? Yeah, that's the, that's I, the start. I, I, I mean, I follow a lot of, like, exactly what we've been talking about, but when it comes to the issue of gay marriage, if there's a certain commitment, I mean, and then, too, like, what if you bring someone to the church who is leaving their gay marriage? Do you recognize the marriage? Do they, if they were to 
That's an easier yeah. one for me. But. Yeah, I mean, do they yeah. get a divorce at so, that point, or does the church even recognize? So, but, yeah, marriage? biblically, marriage is only between a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. And so before God, a marriage between people of the same sex wouldn't be a marriage in his eyes. A union, right. So regardless of what, I mean, at one point, that, that's what St. Valentine is famous for. The, the emperor made marriage illegal, and he still married people. So regardless of what the government says marriage is, God defines marriage. And so, and I don't, I don't know if this is Rising Sun's official position, so you can, you can shoot me down if not. But that person who comes to the church in a gay marriage, that marriage is not a marriage in the sight of God, and so that divorce is not a divorce in the sight of God. Is that marriage marriage is not man's. Marriage is the Lord's. So if it's God's, he gets to tell us what it is. And um, I think that's really important to kind of understand in that subject a little bit. Um, I do think all right, so so just to open it up, I mean, we've had we've had um, homosexuals who were married, who were a part of our church. Other people don't know that. We didn't we didn't marry them. I don't. Maybe some of us went to the marriage. I did not. It was before my time. But man, they they worshipped with us every Sunday online. They contributed to our church financially. We had a relationship with them. We loved them. They came to our building during the special big events, right? Christmas Eve, Christmas services, Easter's, whatever it might be. And any time they saw me and I saw them, it was always a cute fellow. Couldn't wait to see it. Right? They, they weren't officially members. They didn't wear the Rising Sun jersey. But they were invited to be a part of us. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. Some of you know who I'm talking about. One of them died last year. In the, in the last four months, she died. And I was ready for them to ask, can we have the funeral at Rising Sun? Elders talked about that already. There's a lot of things that the church doesn't know on what we're ready for and what we do and what we've decided. Because it's we're not going to broadcast every decision. Well, I've been there. I know that. I know. And so what, what we were ready to do is if they asked, is to serve the family with the funeral. Now, another question that kind of, kind of came up is, would you have officiated the wedding? And I could not. Personally, I could never do that. Um, as a church, I'm not sure we'll ever officiate a gay wedding. I don't think that will ever be something we do. I don't think we can. But can we love people? Yes. Can we serve people? Yes. Do they have to be perfect for us to do that? I hope not, because then I'm not right. a part of it. Me neither. But, but I will say that there are, it, go, go back through the four chair discipleship book I've talked about a hundred times. <laughs> and in those four chair discipleship processes, that's basically the invitation of Christ to the church for all people. Come and see. Everyone's welcome to come and see. Follow me. As many people that here come and see are welcome to follow him. But what following him means is we have to leave the nets. We have to leave our old life. That's where Roger's passages that he identified tonight are really important. And very few decide to follow Jesus. And even fewer yet decide to, to become fishers of men. Right? And so the line for church, for like celebration and you know, relational equity is probably in that spot where somebody says, I'm all in with Jesus. That's where we're at. That doesn't mean that we won't love everyone. We certainly will. It doesn't mean that we won't serve everyone. That's it. We certainly will. But there is an expectation of the believer to leave their former life. That That's not my rule. That's his. Here's one perspective yes. on the way. Mm-hmm. When, yeah, when it comes to like celebrating with those people. Um, this so this is from the Guiding Families uh, book, and this it's is a really good book. which is a yeah. home point, yeah, which is a home point, you which you can purchase for a sum of money. Um, <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. Um, so this is <laughs> this is a, an evangelical pastor's prayer at his gay son's wedding. Um, so, Lord, we gather today in our deep love for David and Caleb. We welcome Caleb and his family into our family. We thank you for Caleb's family and their love for us. We thank you for giving both both of our families two incredible sons who are intelligent, talented, and sacrificial in their service to others. We thank you for all our faithful friends who join us today. We thank you most of all for giving your son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. May each one of us know him more and more as the days of our lives pass. May each one of us discover the incredible plans and purposes you have appointed for our lives. Bless David and Caleb. Shower them with love. Grow their faith. Fill their hearts. Develop your purpose, purposes in their lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, I guess from this, he's Sounds not... like a side A. Well, he's not condoning what they're doing, but he's celebrating with them. And and that's a fine <coughs> line, and, and I recognize people like... People will fall on either side of that line, for sure. Um, but I think where he's coming at it from is more that... Uh, from from a relational aspect, this is an important event in his son's life, um, and yes, it, 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 there he may have like he may have convictions, and he might need to hold to those convictions. But you need to recognize if if you're up close to this person and you hold to your convictions, there might be relational damage from that, and and you have to gauge, I guess, each person. Um, how strong are your convictions, and are they worth that damage? Because mm -hmm. that damage will either require healing, or you may never quite get it back. Mm -hmm. So, so that's I mean that's a hard thing, um, and like like most of most of the things we said tonight, you know, there's no easy answer to it. Um, but yeah, I, I think I just thought I thought of this immediately. I, I thought it was worth noting. What page was that on? Sixty-seven. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. This this book came out about six years ago. I don't. I, it's your definition of new might be different than mine. It's not that new. Yeah. And um, it while it is helping identify, <clears throat> you got to remember how fast the conversations have been moving. <laughs> And so a lot of a lot of issues that you're maybe hoping to find settled tonight, specific to your circumstance, might not be identified in this book. Um, just just as kind of a, a qualifier, I guess. I love that prayer because he was inviting Christ into their lives, and his, which you know, is what we're called to do. Right, what what an opportunity for him to to yeah. pray that into their lives and let Absolutely. the Holy Spirit and God's yeah. yeah. work. Because it's it's not. Not saying that it's I would make the same yeah. choice, but mm -hmm. just it just struck me as you read that that he did not condone what they were doing, but he invited God into their lives. And the challenge to me in ministry is if. If I am, and I have to answer this question for myself, if I'm there to be representing Christ's uh, condolence or exception, acceptance of that situation, I'm that representative, then I have to decide, is that what he wants? And then mm -hmm. can I do that? If that's what I'm there for as a representative of Christ, can I do that? And a clear conscience to say that's what he wants in a decision. I can say I love you, I accept you as a person, all those things. Yeah. But the challenge in a, in a, from a ministerial type thing mm -hmm. that I struggle with in that situation too mm -hmm. is can can I condone something that God doesn't condone? Mm -hmm. If it's contrary to what God has said, can I say that God? Yeah. I'm putting my God stamp of approval on this because that's how many <laughs> people see the minister as God's representative. Can, can I ask, uh, I, I, I guess it's a rhetorical question that I kind of ask myself in these situations. Is me going to the wedding, do people interpret that as me condoning it? Sometimes. So, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Uh, well, yeah you, I mean, you, right. it's a spectrum. 
Right. I'm talking about Ab absolutely. Which people. Which people. Absolutely. Best, and, yeah. and if I don't go, some people are going to interpret Notice. that as me hating these people yeah. and being bigots and homophobes. Right. Yeah, and so, yeah. wh which, which side do I want to risk falling on? Is, is how I approach it, and I'm not saying that's the right answer, but that's how I and, might and, and my personally approach Mine was it. more specific and honed in on that, because if I'm asked to do that ceremony... Right, that's, that's, a, that's that a different... Is, that is a, you talk about a dilemma you get to deal with. Yeah. There's one to deal with, right. because how do, I, how do I become one of them without... And how do I... Well, somebody told me this years ago, if I remember it right. Become one with them without becoming one of them. There's, there's a... There's a, a, how do you love somebody? Because when I work in a lot of situations with a lot of people in the situation, they don't want you just to accept, they want you to condone and embrace mm -hmm. completely. It is, it, and if you don't, then you are a hater. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. so there's, yeah, there I, I think patients. that's a different question. I'm not sure John is necessarily asking that question. I, you, you might be ordained and you might saying, officiate. Though, yeah, but, that, that, but that's the challenge at yeah. times yeah. Yeah. From, from that one specific situation. I guess in the prayer that you just read, it doesn't say that he was marrying them. Mm -mm. No, I don't think he was. I think he was right. Just there. So there's where he drew the line. Okay. He was not officiating. Mm -hmm. I got the, that impression anyway. Right. That was a prayer he offered. He was <coughs> right. Yeah. Actually, something yeah. else that I noticed in that prayer is I didn't, and maybe I just missed it, but I didn't hear him um, blessing their union. I heard him. Thanking the Lord for two incredible men, mm -hmm. um, and, and I them. heard yeah. a lot of honor and respect in how He communicated about them and their families, without ever um, saying this is such a beautiful relationship and marriage, and we're so excited, Lord bless and give longevity to this marriage. Like that's not what I what I heard in there, and I thought that was a really really graceful balance. Uh, uh, honoring them and honoring both families um, and just really keeping restoration in those relationships without saying, yeah, I'm for this, but I'm for you, is what I heard in the prayer. I guess part of the prayer that I heard that sounded like a side B was it sounded in the verbiage like he was talking to them as if they had already adopted the faith because let us grow in our faith in Jesus. And then when I hear that, and I'm thinking, okay, these are Christians who are homosexuals getting married, the way the prayer sounded, that's why it sounded like it was from a side A perspective. It, it may have been, he's an evangelical pastor, so. Sorry, it's possible that's the case. It's also possible the way that it was phrased to the us was generalized to the families or something like that's that. That's true, too. Joey, you guys have to speak up, son. It's possible that that us was generalized to the families and not necessarily about the two young men. It's, it's possible either way. Like he was saying, right. that's why he interpreted it as a side B condoning of homosexual activity as well. Side, side A. Sorry, side A. Um, but you paying attention? <laughs> <laughs> Get your terms right. <laughs> I was yawning with Tim behind the camera. <laughs> yes, Diane. I kind of want to go back to what Chris is sharing and observing in her work with the youth. And as we've got Rod, you're going to help us kind of try to do a little more with youth and families, supporting families and youth and having youth activities, I guess, is what I'm thinking of doing. Um, with who's ever involved, who God's calls to be right, right. helping with that. But I, that, I feel like it's probably going to be something that we're going to have more of. So I think it's important that we are aware, and I still think it is, and all of us discipling others, regardless of it's LGBT, whatever, right. single moms, um, former people who've been sex trafficked, whatever. It's just people we need to love and, and minister to. But I think we do need to be aware that that probably is going to be something that's going to come up more within our youth. Of, Thing because it has seemed to be yeah I think that's I think that's what Steve started out with and what Levi was talking about is it's going to be a problem if we don't start talking about it and and um, it is a problem yeah. it's going to be a bigger Sorry, problem I, if we you yeah, know you're head. right you're yeah. right <laughs> yeah if, it is a problem but it's going to be bigger if we don't uh, get it yeah that was like something we talked about which I think I, I failed to mention earlier but. 
Um, yeah, like if, if you ha if you haven't had firsthand experience with this topic yet, you're probably going to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like it's 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 coming into the churches, and we hope it does because we want them to come into the churches. Mm -hmm. Well, society today, I mean, I was born in 1950, <coughs> you know, and things were very vanilla ice cream back then. I am. <laughs> we're all elderly. But, you know, then I went to school in the 60s during, you know, the racial turmoils mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. and still this subject was quiet. Mm -hmm. It's not quiet anymore. The movies, the TV, and the kids are exposed to stuff so early. And I remember clearly a few years ago sitting around our dining room table with all of our grandkids eating pizza, and I was like the kid at home alone. I couldn't believe what they were telling me what was going on at school. And this is for, you know, this is like 10 years ago. So it's it's there, it's real, it's out there, and I I pray for these school teachers, and we need Christian school teachers in public schools. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I th I think the best way to interact with that is just to do what we're doing and to have those conversations. Um, another different conversation that also needs to be had is, uh, but it's similar is last I heard the the average age that a child is introduced to pornography is seven, I think. That was 11. Might be 11. Seven. 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 Um, so that's average age, right? That, so, that moves as fast as the other conversation. So some, yeah. some are yeah. being exposed earlier. Mm -hmm. Some are being exposed later. And yet we're right. waiting until we're like 16 to have conversations about sexuality. Right. And, and so parents need to navigate that with yeah. their own wisdom and, and, and to, you know, move through that. But... The conversation shouldn't be avoided. If it is, you're letting someone else define the conversation for well, your kids. And, okay, so the porn conversation, that one, like you said, is a different one that starts about seven. Mm -hmm. But for gender and uh, trans and all the different things, that's starting even younger. Mm -hmm. And I can say that because Disney put in their contracts this year that in the next five years, at least 50% of their shows that they have released will have... Um, a gay representative. Represent, representative in their showings. Mm -hmm. So that's what our kids are watching because that's what we grew up on. So happy Disney, yeah. Yeah. right? But it already there's okay. so many <laughs> characters and some of the new ones that were released the last couple of years. I'm like, I I don't know if this is a male or female character. Yeah. I don't, you know. And so yeah. they're actually getting it really starting in toddler years Absolutely. for these conversations. And I I think it's important. Just to identify that right now, because we are behind the eight ball on the conversation, we're going to specifically identify how do we um, interact with this here, right? It would be super easy to jump on a, a bandwagon with Disney and other, and I know that's not what you're advocating, but culturally what we're we're not we're not engaging a cultural war either what we really want to do as a church is to help prepare our people and you and ourselves for these conversations and more than conversations advancement of the gospel and how to love and how to serve love love. that's what we are trying to do we're going to let jesus handle the world we're going to let jesus handle disney we're going to let jesus handle stuff you know so i apologize if you know, no, I, like, I didn't do it that way my my heart was it's it's important to identify or to know what's being taught to yes. our kids so that we know to be having Absolutely. a conversation because if we aren't having a conversation, someone else is. And so that's where it yeah. starts it, at home so that they can be speaking truth for sure. and that's where we can be loving well. Um, but if you don't know what they're being bombarded yes. with, then you can't even begin the conversation for with sure. them. So that was my part in that yeah. comment on yeah. a yeah. 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 Disney. Yeah. Yeah. Every human being is being exposed continually to all of these issues, right. regardless of age. And you can bury your head in the sand, but it won't make it go away. And how you 
is if you learn, if you, I think the goal partly is to learn how to interact and how to respond and not just react to people for Christ. Let, let me take, let's just do one more question. Is there a question left? Great. How do you think the church has addressed the issue of sex outside of marriage between male and female? Mm-hmm. And how does that compare to you know, sex outside yeah. of marriage between male and male? I, I think he hit on it really well when he talked about um, the yeah stewardship of the marriage conversation in general. Uh, we idolize it, yes, but also we shy away from things like a divorced person divorcing for you know, not the, the biblically laid out reasons for divorce or cohabitation and sleeping together and different things like that. We shy away from the conversation because it's awkward, uh, which I understand. It's awkward for me too. Um, but that is a big, a big beef that the LGBTQ plus community has with churches is they're like, Hypocrite. Yeah, th- you're dying on this hill, but look at all these other things that you consider yeah. sin that you're not saying a word about. You don't have to put it to the level. Steve and I just had this conversation probably a month ago. You don't have to bump it up to the level, I guess. They, they don't have to be equal. You don't even have to necessarily communicate, which is worse or, or whatever. But at least talk about it. Like, at, at least be consistent. Like, at, at least... <laughs> Stand against sin in all marriage and sexual forms. It doesn't matter what the preference of immorality. Just to give some perspective on that, I think that part of the reason that the uh, people in the church tend to shy away from those conversations about sexual immorality between a man and a woman outside of marriage is because it's more close and personal of an issue almost because most people are sexually immoral or at least have struggled with that to some degree in their life what but then on my end, <laughs> yeah, i struggle with that so then a second part of that is between a man and a woman like those are still people actions of this topic and throwing it out into the internet like that that's kind of the it's, it's, of it. it's kind of like what you're speaking to is kind of the um like why I think it's so important to form relationships with people that are gay, because then it's yes. not because if, if it's, it's, not if it's someone issue. in your church who's li- like who's um, living with their girlfriend, like a guy who's living with his girlfriend and having they're having sex. That's like that's a little bit harder approach than to just say, oh, if we're talking about homosexuality, I think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. You right. Know? When you know, when you also have a gay couple sitting much. right next to that couple, mm-hmm. then you're not gonna say that. Mm-hmm. Just like you're not gonna say yeah. that about yeah. yeah. So yeah. it. it However, so that's just that's not justification, but that's just part of the reason why I think um, that that conception is there that the church identifies homosexual sin, but not other sexual sin as well. I think it's just because of that maybe psychological and personal reason that we're not calling that out as well. Right. However, with that, the solution is the same: build a relationship and bring them closer to Christ. Yes. Bingo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, that's the application. Someone. The application is to buy God, the guy. That would, be an, <laughs> that would be an application we've been talking about for years. So officially, the conversation has begun at Rising Sun, and I'm excited for that. It's been long overdue for sure. Um, this Steve is, expects a line of people outside of his office to know at eight o'clock, yeah. right? <laughs> it's sermon day, so I'm not going to be. Oh, you yeah, had sermon day yesterday. yesterday. I took the day off yesterday. Oh, what? Yeah. These are all the books. There's no left in there now. Point three stars. I know. Well, so give give us just wow. a little patience on this one specifically because this is a really good book. Uh, some of these, and just so you're aware, these are in the library. They are in my personal library. <laughs> what that means is it's the it's the one right beside the office that I office in. Conference room. If you do rent it or borrow it, I need to know that you borrowed it. Okay? And you are welcome. Levi, what's my philosophy on borrowing one of my books and writing in it? Do it. There. <laughs> I like it when what? you do. It's just okay. Doodle in it for fun. Just yeah, don't draw doodle in it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing, one thing <laughs> I want to say to just words. as a point of clarification, if you would like to have Levi's notes, he has said he'll make those available to you. Um, so you could probably just email ministry assistant at Rising Sun Church 
tomorrow, and then we can send that over to you. Okay. They might not make a lot of sense. But you can <laughs> All right. <them. laughs> yes. Quick question about why messy grapes. It it should be actually. There's two others that I could add. Let me throw those to you real quick. Messy Grace was probably the very first book that I actually was given on this subject. It's phenomenal. It's foundational. It will change your life. Messy Grace is really good. Okay, Caleb Kaltenbach, and right now he's actually the leading expert on this, leading authority on this. Probably best source material that we have. He should. That should have probably made it. And that's in Home Point too. It is in Home Point. There's <laughs> two other. Hey, you can purchase more. more. Yeah. There are there are two Except other website resources. I want to make sure that you know. I'm gonna say it again. Two other website resources I want you to know about. One of those is Q Christian. Q Christian. That that well that's the. It, you need to know. It's it's the opposing yep. opposing. Uh, opposite, side A. Side A. Side A. Yes. Yes. But there is. Yeah, Another I didn't one. put it on there, um, but I do think it's important to, to like to read things that you know you probably aren't going to agree with. Mm-hmm. Um, when I when I was first looking for resources, one of the things that I did um, was message a couple of my friends, one of which was non-binary, one of which is bisexual, and ask them for like their books about this stuff or their like their information, and that was one of them. That was one of the sites, but to to understand. Where the other, where, a, like a side theology people are coming from, or gathered. And if you want a good source material for side B, another good website is called yourotherbrothers.org, um, and it's interesting. Like it's, you want to get, you want to be saturated in a lot of this stuff and really have a good, mm, balanced portfolio on this information. Those are two really good websites mm-hmm. to find. Mm-hmm. And uh, any more? I have a book I would recommend. Okay. That fits with the love them. Yep. Um, the gospel comes with the house king. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It is good. That's yeah. my knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. I just want to say this. how encouraged I am by the intelligent conversation these young men have, and Avery, this young woman, has because I get. I know what I think, but to be able to articulate it, I'm not, I struggle. And, but it also just encourages me that this generation is deep engaged. thinking and engaged. And yes. I just have really applied wealth of information with these guys. Um, okay, so Tim, why don't you pray us out? I'd love to. God, thank you for uh, giving us minds that can process things, uh, Mm -hmm. for giving us the ability to think things through, and um, not just to think things through, but to think them through together, uh, to have a community um, with which we can bounce our ideas off of, to be shot down, or to be confirmed, or um, whatever, but that we can sharpen each other. I thank you that Rising Sun is um, starting this conversation, that they are... Mm -hmm opening up the door uh, again um, in order to see what becomes of it so that people can be equipped, so that people can be ready for these conversations, so that they can be comfortable when someone asks them what they believe um, and that they can love people well. I pray that you would remind us all to love well, to not so much seek to be understood, but seek to understand not so much seek to be loved, but to love, Um, not so much seek to speak our truth and feel better about ourselves, and maybe the truth, but um, to hear from people, to show that they're valuable, to show that their voices matter, that they matter, that we care for them, because you care for them, God, and we are your walking representations on earth, so I pray that we would Hold your spirit um, well, that we would let you change us and transform us, and that you would work through us to affect our communities, to affect our Jerusalems, to affect our Samarias, and ultimately that the end of the world would be affected. I pray this in Jesus' name.